Good morning to all of the attendees in the meeting. We before we even start, we want to apologize for all the technical difficulties that we had in the morning. They were all unforeseen and we finally got in, so it's a pleasure that you're here. And before Greg Dunbar kicks off the facilities meeting, we want to walk the audience through the Q&A feature of the live Teams meeting event. In your screen, you should have two icons. One icon should say leave, and that is the icon that you would use to leave the meeting once it's concluded. The next icon will be a commentary um, figure that has a question mark and a question mark inside. You will press that to ask, ask questions to the presenter at any given point during the presentation. Please know that each presenter will prompt a questions and answers session at the end of each, each, each of their presentations, and that is the opportunity that you will take to ask questions. Once you press on the questions and answers icon, another screen will pop up and it would allow you to ask questions at that time. You will press ask questions to write and type your questions. The team's live event questions and answers feature will ask you to enter your name, type of question, and you will click send. Once the question is sent, the meeting moderator will manage those questions accordingly and will proceed to answer those questions with the help of the presenters. At this time, I would like to turn the meeting over to Greg Dunbar. Thank you, Oksana. Uh, Robin Kenny was scheduled to uh, provide opening remarks today, but she unfortunately had a, another commitment uh, shortly after our scheduled opening. Uh, we are very glad that you've joined us today. Um, like to um, convey Robin's intent to tell everyone that operations are a, a vital important part of district operations in terms of student safety, well-being. Uh, I will tell you as an architect, I believe that you know educational facilities uh, play an important role in you know, the education of kids, obviously, but in terms of inspiration and uh, just the environment that is created. Uh, due to the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, KDE will be issuing guidelines, I think later today, uh, for uh, you to consider as Robin indicated, they're basically questions and not directives. Uh, would like also to remind you of the KDE COVID-19 web page. Uh, health related questions are, could be directed to Angie McDonald and we also understand that the uh, Department of Public Health will be issuing guidelines uh, in the future, in the near future as well. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce myself again. Uh, I'm manager of the district facilities branch. I'm an architect. I have four other architects who work with me. Uh, Gary Least, James Bauman, Marcus Highland, and John Gilbert. And we are very ably assisted by our resource management analyst, Denise Hartsfield. We feel like the construction of school buildings is sort of a linear process that begins with planning. And for that reason, I'm going to turn the uh, program over to John Gilbert to address that. But first, I must ask if you have any questions regarding what I've said to this point. We do not have questions as of yet, Greg. All right, thank you, Jody. Next slide, please. Uh, thanks, Greg. Uh, my name is John Gilbert, and while I'm new at uh, KDE, uh, I've been here for about eight months. I have been doing school work uh, for nearly 20 years, so 
uh, new to the spot, but uh, not new necessarily to this process. Uh, I am here to discuss facility planning for school districts and their regulatory requirements for uh, 702-KAR-4180, as they reference the Kentucky School Facilities Planning Manual. This manual is primarily used by uh, KDE districts, facilities branch, school districts, and their consultants to organize, plan for, and prepare district facility plans, also known as a DFP. Now, while it's a requirement for districts to have a DFP to qualify for their apportionment of restricted fund sources by identifying their qualifying unmet need on a DFP, districts really need to take this opportunity to provide a vision for their facility needs to help support the continued educational efforts of your schools for your communities. This plan is developed not by one single entity or one group, but a cross section of your district with assistance from architects, engineers, facilitators, and KDE. This cross section of your district that I mentioned oversees the process as determined by this regulation. This cross section of your district is called your local planning committee, which I'll reference as LPC. Districts organize the local planning committee to manage and oversee the process as directed by the local school board. The committee members themselves are selected by each school facility, the local school board, and requests throughout through advertisements to the community to create the 10 to 20 member community. These 10 to 20 member uh, committee may be based on the size of your district and the number of school facilities you have may determine the number of uh, committee members you have. The final, cre the final creation of the LPC will then be approved by the local board and KDE. If any members uh, live outside the district, a request to the Commissioner of Education's office is required to allow for out of district members. The manual has a process. I will not get detailed or super further into that at this time, but it is a step-by-step -step process that we can walk you through if needed. The LPC will eventually, through three or more meetings, will draft a DFP to recommend to the local board. Now, before I forget, let me take a second to mention that unlike capital construction efforts, which are performed in fact pack on SharePoint, uh, which uh, Greg and Denise will discuss later, your DFP process will go through email and direct communication with your project manager. And you can find that manager listing, if you do not know, on the uh, uh, KDE website. Our, our email will be illustrated at the end of this presentation as well. Uh, if you ha have not had a need to contact us in a while, you may also uh, uh, call KDE Direct and go through the system. You should be able to get a uh, district facility branch member to help you. Now, the other portion of assembling the committee and information is performed by your design professionals. Um, uh, the information that is assessed. The existing facilities are assessed by uh, architect engineers for condition and educational suitability. This assessment may and should be happening while the LPC is being assembled. A board may task their design professional to perform these services. This assessment has changed over the years and we are currently moving forward with facility assessments to be integrated with the Kentucky Facility Inventory and Classification System, also known as KFIX. KFIX is the statutory requirement of our legislators to provide equitable means of condition reporting for existing facilities. With that provided information, we are further incorporating this information in for use in the regulatory means to inform the DFP process by using this information for planning efforts as well. Next slide, please. While LPC will review district finances with their physical agent, they may also review any other pertinent data presented to make informed decisions for their plan for their district. Other items to review may include orientation information from KDE, uh, facility assessments from design professionals, along with the KFIX information provided. Uh, transportation needs also in the district and how, kid, you know, how long are kids on the bus? Uh, uh, may have an impact in terms of how you create your plan. 
the current DFP and what has been completed in the last four years may also in, inform a LPC. Uh, one thing I like to do through that process is take that current DFP and mark out the items that have been completed. It shows members what has been done and what efforts have been made in the previous four years. Uh, and any other information that may seem pertinent to the LPC and school administra administrators to present. Once information is reviewed, the LPC may then develop a draft plan and submit to KDE facilities. Plan is prioritized based on facility assessments and physical ability. Priorities one through four are eligible for restricted funding. Priority five is eligible for unrestricted funds only. To further expand on these priorities, think of them in short as follows. Uh, priority one would be the highest uh, classroom priority in the first biennium of the two years of the plan, uh, the first two budget years. For example, 2020 to 2022. Uh, these are your instructional areas, your schools. Priorities one and two uh, highlight school use. Uh, so think of classroom use first and others uh, past this. So the first binding would be priority one. Once you get through that, you would go to priority two, which is the same type of priority classroom use uh, and school use, but this would be done after priority one type items. Priority threes are non-educational support areas. We don't often see these, but if you have projects where you've got uh, the school areas are done themselves, but you're essentially down to um, uh, just like an admin or a kitchen addition, the, this would be the area that you would consider that. Priority fours, which are also part of that unmet need, um, is, are the district support, support spaces like bus garages and what have you, uh, central offices, uh, storage facilities and the like. Now, discretionary projects are not qualifying for restricted fund sources, but it is an opportunity for districts to list other needs, such as ball fields, dugouts, uh, and other practice type or field house type facilities. You may also have other classroom needs that are beyond um, uh, priorities one through four that you would want to use general fund or unrestricted funds for that would not qualify for those restricted needs that would be listed at this location. Once the plan is created by the LPC and reviewed, it may receive comments from KDE as part of our approval. Then both the LPC and school board could approve the plan. Following board approval, plan is presented in a public hearing. That plan, just like all your meetings, would have an advertisement process. And I won't get into those details at this time, but you can certainly ask your reviewer. Plan is presented to the Kentucky Board of Education for final approval and implementation. Now, the planning manual will note step to step, but what happens if everything does not have a unanimous approval? If disagreements occur, the manual has a process that you simply repeat until parties are in agreement. Uh, everybody's plan would have will be different, some a lot smoother than others, of course. This concludes the planning presentation component to this meeting, other than I would like to note um, to all that the regulations are currently under review and the process will be revised to account for and include KFIX assessment information in a more formal way as it would relate to 4170 and 4180. Greg may touch on that a little bit later uh, in his part of the presentation. Uh, that's all I have now. Uh, Jody, uh, do you have any questions for us in this portion? We have not received any questions. I would like to remind the audience that you are more than welcome to submit your questions and we will attempt to answer those during this live meeting. I also want to remind all of our participants this meeting is being recorded for viewing purposes later. Um, at this time, we will proceed with the presentation. James, you're muted. This is James Bauman. Thank you for coming. Once planning is set, the next item to consider is project financing. Funding for district con construction comes from various sources, local and state. Local monies come from a percentage of local property taxes, known as nickels. These in turn are matched by state appropriations, also known as equalization. Districts can elect to add nickels to their property taxes to properly fund construction of new and maintenance of existing facilities. 
At the present time, the legislature is not equalizing additional nickels. These monies make up the district building fund and can only be used for construction and together make up the FSPK, the facility support program for Kentucky. State monies come from the match nickels as mentioned above, SEEK, which is the basic funding mechanism coming out of Frankfurt, and monies based on average daily attendance. Attendance-based monies are considered capital outlay monies, and up to 80% of these funds can be used to finance construction. SEEK monies are distributed to the district's general fund and can be used on any priority project. SEEK is the basic funding mechanism coming out of Frankfurt. FSPK, SEEK, Building Fund, Capital Outlay, are considered restricted funds and only, can only be used for priorities one through four as noted on the district facility plan. General funds can be used for any priority project. Note that building fund and capital outlay are considered restricted funds. I'm repeating myself. Building fund and capital outlays are time limited for use and will revert to SFCC funds if not used, and we'll discuss SFCC on the next slide. With multiple funding sources, multiple eligible priorities, school funding can be very complex. So consult with your finance officer and your fiscal agent. If you have any questions about project financing, please call us to discuss initiating the process so that when the project is initiated, we can approve your application. Next slide, please. Another source of funds is the SFCC, the School Facilities Construction Commission Offer of Assistance. This is based on the unmet needs report due to SFCC in October of odd numbered years. The report is based on the amount of need shown on the current DFP, current being defined as June 30th of that year, minus the local available revenue. SFCC funds are more restricted than the funds on the last slide. They can only be used for bonding projects in priority order and only on priorities one and two. Unused building fund, unused capital outlay funds become SFCC funds and require SFCC approval to use. So it's best to use those funds as they are available before additional restrictions are placed and they become SFCC funds. SFCC offers of assistance as mentioned above are also time limited for use by the district. Please be aware of those expiration dates and plan accordingly. A ranked report with school conditions and educational suitability is prepared every year to present to the LRC for their consideration. Are there any questions, Jody? At this time, we've not received any questions. I'd like to remind the audience that you can ask any questions you may have about the content being presented in your Q&A feature. I also would like to remind the participants that this meeting is being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later date. At this time, we'll proceed with the presentation. Thank you, Jody. We're going to talk about the capital construction process, which is administered by the branch. Uh, we view construction as sort of a linear process that starts with a BG1 project application. Uh, for those of you all who have not been around for a long time, BG uh, comes from um, buildings and grounds, which is what our work area was known as many years ago. When we receive a project application as uh, John and James have sort of uh, alluded to, the first thing that happens is uh, it goes to our education resource analyst, financial analyst, uh, who views the BG1 relative to the availability of the funds that are listed on that form. After that's done, it then goes to one of the four project managers to review and make sure that the funds, as James just suggested, uh, are um, appropriate for the priority of the project that's being proposed. At that time, we also look to see that the appropriate forms are attached 
uh, within FACPAC, which Denise will talk about later. Uh, BG1s are uh, approved relative to their fund sources, their scope, and a, a variety of other sort of scoring metri metrics when they are uh, processed through the system. Uh, tier one projects are educational facilities that involve bond sales. Tier fours may be uh, priority five projects that are funded with general funds. And uh, two and three uh, are somewhere in the middle. As we have suggested, uh, all our regulations are currently under review, and this particular regulation needs to be revised to um, reflect the workflow in FACPAC, which is our document submittal system, as well as the documents uh, that we use from American Institute of Architects, AIA, that are incorporated by reference and, and change periodically. The submittal process, as I said, is a, a linear process that begins with the BG1. After a BG1, uh, a owner architect agreement should be submitted for our review and approval. And then the appropriate submittals based on the tiering of the project. Um, tier one projects require schematic design, design development, and construction document submittals. Uh, we re review anything related to educational buildings uh, relative to the guide here, which is contained in 702 KER 4170, which John referenced, and also needs to be updated. Uh, for those of you who routinely uh, interact with us, uh, one of our uh, difficulties is related to post-bid BG1 submittals. Uh, for bonds to be sold, those post-bid submittals need to be complete, including um, purchase order summary forms to support the proposed contract amount. You know, FACPAC gives us the ability to essentially provide project accounting on our end um, to the penny. And we sort of expect those that are involved in the process to understand that and to also give us uh, enough time prior to a bond sale to review those documents. Any questions? Craig, we don't I would have like to time. say would like to say that the, the two questions that we get more than anything else are one, do I need a BG1? And two, do I need an architect or design professional? BG1 require, are required when restricted funds are used, um, when an architect is needed for code compliance with the Kentucky Building Code, and if the project involves a need that has been stated on the district facility plan. The requirement for architects is not that of Kentucky Department of Education. Those, in fact, are statutes. KRS 322 uh, addresses the requirements for engineering services, and KRS 323 addresses the need for architectural services related to educational projects. Both of those contain uh, complementary language related to um, repair and maintenance, which can sometimes be sort of a, a sticking point. Uh, repair and maintenance is defined in those statutes as work that does not 
change the original design intent of the facility. So if there are no other questions, uh, next slide, please. Hi, I'm Denise Hartsfield and I'll be presenting FACPAC. FACPAC, that's our Facility Planning and Construction. It's our system to manage construction documents. This allows for the electronic submission, review, and approval of documents, such as your BG1, contracts, construction documents, purchase orders, change orders, BG4, and BG5. Now, superintendents, finance officers, and facility directors should all have access to FACPAC. If not, just send me an email and we'll get you set up. Uh, the district would give third parties access at the project level. Now the district owns their data and everything is transparent. <clears throat> you can check the tracking tab on each FACPAC form to see where it is in the process. Uh, if any FACPAC form has a status of saved on it, that means it's not been processed to send it into KDE. Now the system is designed that way. You can enter information in, come back to it later. If you get interrupted, no problem, just save it and come back to it later. Okay, now when a FACPAC document is approved, you'll receive a FACPAC system generated email uh, saying it's approved or possibly it is sent back to you incomplete because it needs further information. Now, every project is started by creating a project in FACPAC. From your FACPAC homepage, click on Create Project. You'll put in an appropriate title, your construction delivery method, and if you want, a third party. Third parties can be added or removed at any time during the project. Now, after you create your project, you can create your BG1. Now, only the district can create the project, the initial BG1, and the BG5. Your third parties can create everything in between, revised BG1s, contracts, purchase orders, change orders, BG4s. Now, when completing the BG1, please complete all of the information. Missing items cause the BG1 to be returned incomplete. A lot of the information is defaulted into your BG1 for you, but you must select your project type, your DFP priority, your inventory that you're building, the scope and the amounts. The DFP priorities and the inventory, your buildings, they're integrated into FACPAC. You have a drop down box and you just select them. Now, after all the information is entered, the FACPAC form is printed, approved by your board, gets the appropriate signatures, and is saved as a PDF. And then it is attached to your online FACPAC form. There's also a user guide on your FACPAC homepage. Next slide, please. Okay, there's also information that is uploaded into FACPAC's My Document Submissions, such as your BG2, BG3, your architect contracts, and some construction documents. At this time, those documents are approved by a separate correspondence. Districts or third parties can upload to FACPAC's My Document Submissions. The document goes into the district's project document library. Only the district can view project document library information um, at this time. Uh, as always, please feel free to contact me if you have any questions or if I can be any, of any assistance. Any questions? We do have a question, Denise. The question is, is a BG1 needed when a mobile unit is needed due to a sudden rise in enrollment, special education in this case? The enrollment was not foreseen and time is short. I'm going to refer that one to Greg. I think he'd be better answer, better able to answer that than I would. Technically, yes, but um, it's only 
primarily to for us to track modulars in the state. Uh, don't let that BG1 submission get in your way unless you're doing it with uh, a restricted fund source, in which case if you do want to use a restricted fund source, uh, approval by KDE of a capital funds request would be required. I would I would like to say too that also uh, modular units are uh, dealt with by the Department of Housing, Building and Construction in their um, I'm trying to remember the acronym for in industrialized buildings, but uh, they do require that the hold downs be uh, reviewed and the location of the uh, unit relative to other construction uh, be compliant with the field uh, required separation distance in the building code. Uh, so you will need some uh, professional assistance with that. I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. And if, if the person who had submitted the question has any additional um, clarifications needed for this, they can contact their project manager, correct? That's right. Okay. We don't have any more questions at this point. I would like to take the opportunity to remind the audience that this meeting is being recorded and will be available for viewing post meeting. At this point, we will resume the presentation. Thanks, Jody, uh, and thank you, Denise. Uh, Denise plays a vital role uh, in our branch and, and we all really appreciate her presence. Uh, also like to take the opportunity today to sort of give you a high level uh, overview of other activities that we do in our inter uh, actions with the districts. Uh, one of those is uh, property acquisition. Uh, in addition to the other things related to planning and construction that Denise and I do primarily is uh, to administer this regulation, which is intended, in my opinion, to address uh, new school building sites, but is also applicable to other acquisitions not specifically related to a new school, which include uh, campus expansions, meaning acquiring a property adjacent to an existing school or for a bus garage or something of that nature. Uh, we do try to administer this regulation with a common sense approach and only require the things that are absolutely necessary to uh, protect uh, the district's interests. And those include, but are not necessarily limited to, um, a title opinion from an attorney for a period of no less than 60 years, a commitment for title insurance, um, an appraisal that's commissioned by the district and not by the seller, uh, a plat that identifies all the property boundaries as well as any easements and uh, certification that's not within the 100 year floodplain. Uh, there's some other uh, things that might be applicable uh, depending on the circumstance. Uh, we also administer the disposal of uh, surplus real property. But I'd like to say that we are not involved in disposal of surplus personal property. Um, regulation also addresses leases and easements. This uh, regulation has been administered under policy for essentially the nearly 11 years that I've been with the dis, uh, department. And we found the need to provide a more structured approach to it for uh, these activities and a new revised regulation uh, has been proposed was to be presented for its first reading at the April uh, KBE meeting, but will be uh, 
heard at the June meeting. Time's really flying these days. One of the other things that we're doing, and quite frankly, are, we're behind on right now, is we post uh, replacement costs on our website for insurance uh, purposes. And these costs are also used um, in the planning process. We revise them every spring. Any questions regarding this? One of the questions that was submitted was, will this PowerPoint be available online? And I've answered that in the published portion. This PowerPoint presentation will be made available post meeting along with a recording of the meeting for anybody who is unable to attend. Um, we do not have any additional questions at this point. We can continue with the presentation. Thank you, Jody. Next slide, please. So in addition to planning, construction, and property, uh, here are some of the other things that we do that sort of impact our workload and may take uh, higher priority at times. Uh, KRS 157-455 requires that the department in conjunction with an, a now defunct agency in the energy cabinet provide an annual report on efficient school design. This is related to energy consumption. And it's to be presented uh, in November of each year. That is the purpose of the BG2 form that's required at the uh, design development phase of project submittals or the CD phase, uh, depending on the tier. Nonetheless, uh, any project, including roofing, because that does impact the uh, thermal envelope of a building, we do need a BG14. Uh, we routinely have to do bill reviews, respond to inquiries from legislat legislators, the LRC, and KDE management, as well as respond to commissioner correspondence, open records request, and, and of course, inquiries from the district. Uh, something is very timely right now, and I've requested a, a summary of legislation that has been passed that will impact our work area uh, to, in order for us to issue memoranda regarding compliance with statutory changes. And also, as I mentioned, uh, AIA documents in the past uh, prevailing wage and uh, the implementation of uh, fact packs. So, uh, we stay uh, very busy. Um, we know you do too. Uh, so uh, we are very respectful of your time and greatly appreciate your participation in today's presentation. Um, and say we're not quite ready for prime time, but we'll get there. Um, I do want to drop back and say that related to capital construction, we meet every week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, even during telecommuting, to review DG1s, um, as well as other issues that we need to discuss. Uh, the first item on the agenda at those meetings is uh, any project that has a pending bond sale. That's why I was stressing the need for complete submittals of post-bid information in a timely manner. Next slide, please. So if you didn't have questions previously, uh, we'll give you another opportunity regarding the topics that we've covered and would remind you that um, all our contact information is on our website. Go to KDE website, a tab for district school support, go to, go to facilities, and then you can access the appropriate things on the left. Um, in terms of, well, Jody, have we received any additional questions? We do. Okay. 
the question that we've received is where are the proposed new regulations? The agenda doesn't seem to be published for the June meeting yet. Uh, I will tell you that I would expect it to be with the agenda and I have no control over when it's posted and I apologize for that. Any more questions? No, sir, at this time we have not received any additional questions. I would like to remind the audience that this PowerPoint presentation and a recording of this meeting will be available, made available to you post meeting. Um, I would also like to remind you that if at, at a later time you come up with some questions that you have about the information that has been presented to you today, you can contact your project manager for any answers that you may seek. Thanks, Jody. I'd like to say too that uh, the next slide is going to be presented by our KFIX project manager. And uh, for those of you uh, that know about KFIX, it's been a, a large undertaking by all districts and the department uh, as mandated by the legislature. And uh, we are working diligently to uh, make this work for us as well as you. And for that reason, Oxane is go going to review uh, uh, some things about the rollover that will occur at the end of the fiscal year, as well as some future training sessions. Oxana. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate that. As you can see on um, the presentation, we are uh, scheduled to do KFIX training commencing next week. Um, we sent an initial communication last week, sending a very high level information on the training sessions. And just yesterday, I sent an email out to all the um, email distribution list for KFIX with the link to each of these training sessions. As mentioned, the sessions will start next week. We, um, Amoresco is offering ten, a total of 10 sessions. There will be five sessions each week with five different topics each week. Um, KDE decided to spread out the sessions to give everyone the opportunity to attend. We do encourage um, the audience that you, if, it, if it time allows, you attend all sessions just because in each of the sessions there will be um, uh, new information or a refresh of information that may be beneficial to you. Uh, some of the questions that I've got as the, after I send the communication is, are this training sessions on, on Eastern time zone? And yes, they are. So the 11 a.m. and the 1 p.m. are uh, training sessions that will come in, commence at that time on the Eastern time zone. And um, there will be sessions offered in the morning and in the afternoon. Tuesday, we, Amoresco is only offering a morning session. And then Wednesdays and Thursdays, there will be two sessions, one at the 11 a.m. time frame and one at the 1 p.m. time frame. Now, another question that I did receive, it was, um, is this training session um, geared towards new um, asset planner users or existing asset planner users? I wanted to make sure it's for existing users. Um, the one hour session will not be enough for a new user, and I'm afraid that the um, information will be too high level for that person to kind of, uh, you know, keep track of the information and understanding what Amoresco is training on. I also want to emphasize that on the Wednesday morning and on the Thursday afternoon, Amoresco will go over new subjects um, on Asset Planner. And those are new software enhancements that were implemented after the initial rollout of the software. And they will also touch bases on the 2020 fiscal year end rollover process in the asset planner system. They will explain what the process will do and what does it mean for you as a user. So I you know, suggest that people attend to those because this is a new process that KDE has not done before that will um, influence some data um, in not influence, but it will kind of change the view and the look and feel of that data. And it is important that you attend. If you have any questions or if you have not received 
the links to the invitation or you just want more details about this training sessions, go ahead and please send me an email to the email address provided in the presentation. Jody, I think we have a few minutes left. Are there any questions, Kate, fix related that the audience may want, may want me to answer? We don't have any questions specifically re related to KFIX at the moment, but we have received a question that perhaps Greg or one of the project managers will need to address. The question is, how will the DFP process look with the current situation, meaning the pandemic, meetings, advertising, submitting sign-in sheets, documentation, etc.? Well, that is a good question. It has been asked. Um, my initial response is included in the FAQ on our web page. Uh, that will be updated based on some input that we've had from our um, attorney assigned to our group uh, within the next uh, few days. Um, I do want to tell you guys too that um, although we're not in the office, we're all working diligently every day. We can be reached by email um, as provided in the contact information in the following slides. Uh, we hope that everyone stays safe and well. And on behalf of the department, Associate Commissioner Robin Kinney, uh, Division Director Donna Duncan, myself, and my team, we thank you for participating in today's presentation, and we look forward to seeing you in person sometime in the future. Okay, at this time we thank everybody for attending and this meeting has concluded.